Good morning, Oasis. I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but Hope and I are in Alabama dropping off Faith for grad school and saying goodbye to uh, our third child. Uh, so pray for us. Uh, we'll be flying back on Tuesday. Uh, but you have a treat this morning. Uh, my good friend Dave Drum is going to share with us. And Dave is the director of J17 Ministries. And the J17 stands for John 17, which is the chapter he's actually going to preach on today. So his entire ministry is named after the chapter of the Bible that he's going to cover today, which is all about unity in the Christian church. So please welcome my friend, Dave Drum. Well, good morning. Let's see. There it is. It is so great to be with you. Um, I have so much respect for Dave Ganey. He's been a dear friend for many, many years. Uh, after going through Potter's Wheel, continued to meet with him on a monthly basis for several years now. Um, he's a, a great friend and a great guide in life. And uh, I, I love being back with you as here a couple of years ago. It wasn't here when I was with your church. It was over at the other school, but great to be back with you today. So I'm excited. Um, let's pray together. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So you have been talking about the question, who is Jesus, especially from the Gospel of John? And uh, that's a terrific question. It's the most important question that there is. And so the first thing that we discover when we jump into John chapter 17 is that he's a man of prayer. Um, the whole chapter of John 17 is a prayer except for the first couple of words. If you have your Bible with you or on your phone or something, I encourage you to follow along because uh, I'm going to jump around a little bit in John chapter 17. It's kind of interesting to think about Jesus as a man of prayer. Um, I'm sure you've talked about over this series Jesus being fully God and fully human. So if he's praying, is he talking to himself? Uh, who, who's he talking to? when he's praying. On, on the one hand, because God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it's like he's talking to his best friend. Um, they're, they're completely one and united. But on the other hand, because he's fully God, the theology of Jesus praying um, raises a bunch of questions that I'm not smart enough to answer. So we'll just leave it that he's a man of prayer. But what we find out pretty quickly um, is that in John chapter 17, he's not only a man of prayer, but he is a focused prayer. He's a man of focused prayer. Um, I don't know if you've ever done this. I can't say that I ever have, where I'm, I'm praying about something and I feel like God is saying, no, don't pray about that, pray about this. I, I don't know that I've ever been that focused. Um, maybe I'll kind of meander and get there eventually. But there's three times in John 17 where he specifically says, I could pray about whatever, but I'm not going to. I'm focused on this one thing that's so important to me. Jesus is a very focused prayer in John chapter 17. This chapter is not kind of stream of consciousness praying where whatever crosses his mind. No, he's, he's got a purpose and he is praying into that purpose all throughout the prayer. Uh, the very first words of the prayer, and you can see it. If uh, I'm not going to put all the words up on the screen. I'll tell you the ones that we're talking about. But the very first words of the prayer in, in verse 1 say, Father, the time has come. So this is the critical time in all of human history. And if you've been with Oasis for a few weeks, you've been on Thursday night for several weeks. Because John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18 
are all Thursday night before Good Friday. So we've seen a number of things that Jesus did. He served the disciples by washing their feet, taught on a number of different topics. Now um, he talked about, taught on uh, all kinds of different topics. I'm sure you've been talking about them over the last several weeks. But one of those topics that he taught on was so important that he decided to pray it. And that's what John chapter 17 is. So um, early on in the prayer in verse 3, he's talking about eternal life. Um, I, I remember when I was in college and uh, working with the, the Navigators, um, a college campus ministry, we did scripture memory cards, and one of them was John 17, 3, because it's the clearest definition of eternal life anywhere in the Bible. It says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, me, whom you sent. That's what eternal life is. Eternal life doesn't wait till we die. Eternal life starts the moment that we come to know who God is, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who Jesus is. That's the definition of eternal life. So it's not surprising to me that the prayer starts focused on eternal life because Jesus knows that within a couple of hours, he's going to give his life on the cross, which is what makes eternal life possible for you and me and every person who's ever lived. So it's not a surprise that that's what he would be praying about. In the next couple of verses, it talks about he's praying specifically for the 12 disciples that he had gathered around them and poured into for the last three years. The first surprise in the prayer, at least to me, comes down in verse 9, where Jesus says, I am not praying for the world. Now, first, it's a surprise because, um, again, he's so focused that he, he, he could be praying for the world, but he says, I'm not going to. Second, it's a surprise because I would have expected Jesus to be praying for the whole world. He's giving his life for the whole world. He loves the whole world. John 3, 16, most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world. Jesus is fully aligned. Jesus so loved the world but he says, I'm not praying for the world. Why is that? The only answer I've been able to come up with to that question is because he had a strategy for how to reach the world. And that strategy is the main thing that we want to talk about this morning. If you have read John 17 even once, um, if you uh, hope this would be a good thing, by the way, if you tuned me out and were reading the Bible and, and reading all of John chapter 17, if you've read it even once, you can't miss that the primary focus of John 17 is our unity. Four different times Jesus prays, may those followers of mine be one, may they be united. May they be brought to perfect unity. That is the focus of this prayer. So rather than go verse by verse, what I'd like to do with you is go through the prayer twice, asking two different questions. As Dave mentioned um, in the introduction, my whole ministry is based around this chapter of the Bible, this prayer. So it's not hard for me to talk about John 17. What's hard is for me to stop talking about John 17. That should be encouraging you to pray for me <laughs> so that we're not here all day, so that I know when to stop and what not to say. So we want to ask the question, what kind of unity is Jesus praying for? How is unity described in John chapter 17? That's the first question. So we'll talk about that, the stuff that's up on the screen right now, until the break, and then we'll ask a different question after the break. We'll come back with a second question about Jesus' prayer for unity. Make sense? Hope that's okay, because that's what we're doing. <laughs> All right. How is unity described? Well, in verse 11, 
Jesus says, may they be one as you and I, Father, are one. So how are Jesus and the Father one? Well, Jesus took on flesh, became a human being, which means that he's limited in time and space. We know where he lived. We know when he lived. We know where all of this was taking place. Um, he, he's limited. Father is spirit, is present at all times, unlimited in time, space, or knowledge. So obviously, Jesus and the Father are not identical. They're, they're on the same team, but they're not identical. So Jesus is praying for unity, not uniformity. Another way to say that is Jesus is praying not that we would all be alike, but that we would all be aligned. Um, diversity in the body of Christ is part of Jesus' gift. That's part of God's gift for us. He doesn't want us all being the same. I have the incredible blessing and privilege of preaching in different kinds of churches almost every week. So I get to go to African-American churches and Latino churches and Messianic Jewish churches and denominational churches and great big churches and little churches. Next week, I'll be in a Quaker church. There's actually one of those here in town, a friend's church. Um, I love that because the body of Christ is wildly diverse, and that's his design. He's not praying for uniformity. He's praying for unity, denominationally, um, ethnically, socioeconomically, geographically. I want to encourage you to grow in your relationship with believers who don't look like you. Because that's how we grow and how we mature. If you have no idea how to do that, besides the people here at Oasis, then uh, our ministry offers something called a John 17 weekend where you'll get to meet people from all over the city, all these different churches, almost a, a hundred different churches participate in these retreats. So sign up for our newsletter and you'll hear about the weekends and invite you, you're invited to the next one. All right, next, in verse 15, we find out that it's a public unity, not a private unity. Because Jesus says, I'm not praying, there it is again, that you would take them out of the world. And down in verse 18, he says, in fact, I'm sending them into the world, just like the message that we just heard for the kids talk. Um, this is a public unity, not a private unity. What happens inside this building this morning, hopefully we're growing in love for one another, that's really important. But it's not what Jesus is praying for. It includes that, but what he's praying for is bigger than that. It's got to be between all the different parts of the body so that the city can see it. Does that make sense? If it's just inside a congregation, the city's not going to see that. Most of the church, most of the city drives by places of worship every Sunday and never even thinks about going in. Less than 10% of Tucson is in a Christian church on any given Sunday. Nine out of ten people that you meet aren't. So the body of Christ has to get out where people are. So church school partnerships, where churches serve a school like you are, um, and foster care, those are just a couple of examples where a united body of Christ in our city is serving and making a difference and changing our city for the better. All right, next one, substantive unity, not a spineless or weak or watered-down unity. Verse 17, Jesus prays, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So Jesus is praying for a unity that is aligned with truth. We often think that the best way to unity is to kind of downplay truth because truth can be divisive. Um, you remember back in John 14 where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
Jesus is praying for a Jesus-centered unity. Um, you can talk about God in, in public and probably not get too much pushback. You can talk about the Spirit, and lots of folks talk about the Spirit and mean all different kinds of things. You mention Jesus, and that's a little more specific. For Jesus, unity and truth are on the same team. They're not opposed to each other. In fact, I think if you have unity at the expense of truth, all it really is is a commitment to be nice, and, and the first conflict, the first strong wind will blow that house of cards right down. That it, there's no staying power to that. But if you have truth at the expense of unity, probably has more to do with arrogance than it does with truth. Because truth and unity go together. That makes sense? All right, the next one, um, verse 20, we find out it's a timeless unity, not a time-bound unity. Again, the kids talk, talked about this. In verse 20, Jesus is specifically praying for you and me. He says, I'm not just praying that for, for those who are with me right now. I'm praying this for all who will ever believe in me through their witness. One of them that he was talking about was John. John wrote things down, and we're reading it right now. We are those who come to know Jesus through their witness. He's talking about us. This is his strategy in every generation. It's not unique to the first century. It's his strategy for every locale. Um, it's his strategy for Pakistan, which is an odd place to mention, except that um, there was a, a guy, a pastor in Pakistan, who found our website, J17 Ministries, went through the website, um, contacted me, said, You're, the book that you wrote, Jesus' Surprising Strategy, we need that in our country. Would you help us get it translated into Urdu? How strange is that? So we, we got it translated into Urdu, and they've been distributing copies around Pakistan. This is written for the church. And yet I keep getting video testimonies of non-believers who are coming to faith in Jesus from reading a book that isn't even written for them. Who knew that Jesus' prayer would actually work? <laughs> I guess I shouldn't be so surprised by that, but frankly, I was. <laughs> this is his strategy for every country and every locale. All right, one more. It's the means, not the end. Verse 23 is, if you had to pick one verse to summarize John 17, I would pick verse 23. It says, may they be brought to such complete unity that the world will come to know who Jesus is, that, that you sent me, and that you love them just as much as you love me. Um, I've got four adult children, a wife of 35 years, and a son-in-law and two grandkids. And there's nothing I want more than for every one of them to know who Jesus is and how much God loves them. Well, verse 23 says that our unity is how that's going to happen. Never would have guessed that. Quick story before we go to break. So um, churches partnering with schools all across the city. So that gives an, me an opportunity to meet with superintendents of school districts because I represent a bigger group than just um, one congregation. So we start doing that. TUSD, the largest and most dysfunctional school district in our city, um, invites us to meet monthly with all of their program directors. So my colleague and I, when I was working at Fort Tucson, um, start meeting monthly. And the first meeting, there's this woman there whose body language was like, get these Christians out of this room. She was not subtle. 
she did not want us there. So we describe a little bit of how churches can serve schools. And at the end of that first meeting, she, she, her job was dropout prevention. Talk about a tough job. So she says, I got one for you, and I know it was a test. She said, uh, here's a family that has 10 kids. The dad's in prison. The mom should be in prison. They need this, 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 and this. How can you help them? So my colleague lines up three churches to serve this one family, and we come back the next month like, next? No, we didn't say that. <laughs> so a couple months down the line, she, she says to us, how come every time I ask you Christians for help, the answer is always yes, but when I ask my own district for help, the answer is always no. <laughs> I don't understand that. That's a pretty good reputation for believers to have, wouldn't you say? So we keep meeting with them. Last meeting of the first school year, and she says to us, along with the other lady who had her arms crossed at the first meeting, the best day of the month is the day you Christians show up. How cool is that? Now, yeah, we can praise God for that. It's a truth-centered unity because she knew who we represented. She, she, she said, you Christians. She was clear on who we were. Year two, we're back. <laughs> um, we start offering church school partnership trainings in schools as well as in churches. And these are Christian trainings. We start with a worship band. And she takes one of her Saturdays, one of her days off, and comes to one of our training. And she sits there all morning, sits through the worship, everything else. At the end of the morning, she comes up to us. She's got tears streaming down her face. And she says, I, I've got a problem, and I don't even know how to describe it. But it's like I've got this hole in my heart. Those were her exact words. And she says, when I'm around you Christians, it gets filled up. But once you leave, I don't know how to sustain that. Can you help me? So I said, well, I'm pretty busy. No, <laughs> um, my, my colleague, who's female, takes her to lunch, shares the gospel with her, her life is radically transformed. She ends up retiring from TUSD, moves to the Bay Area, and starts church school partnerships in the Bay Area of the United States. She never would have met Jesus were it not for a unified church coming to her. So, as we take a little break... Um, if you want something to think about, ask the question, how can you be an answer to Jesus' prayer? And after the break, we'll be a little bit shorter than the first part, I promise. Okay, uh, three minutes. <clears throat> All right, come on back. <clears throat> Doesn't look like we lost too many people. That's good. So. <laughs> Around 2016 or so, um, I, at that point, had been working for five years full-time, um, primarily focused around answering Jesus' John 17 prayer here in Tucson and any place else that God gave me influence. I'd been a pastor for 21 years before that but had been doing this full-time for five years, I had probably, I don't know, I, I'll bet I had probably preached or taught on John 17 maybe a hundred times by that point, written a book on it, and completely missed a pattern that was in John 17 the entire time, and I missed it. I was at a prayer summit with other pastors, and the facilitator pointed it out, and here it is. There's only four requests that Jesus makes, four petitions 
in John 17. It's actually a very tightly structured prayer. There's only four requests that he makes. He repeats each one of those requests at least once. His prayer that we would be made one is repeated three times, in there a total of four times. And in between the first and the second time in every single one of them, Jesus shares something about how he personally in his ministry here on earth had been invested in that request. And that's a little bit complicated, but we'll go through each of their requests and see what that looks like. So it's a very tightly structured prayer. Now, I shared a little bit of this very briefly the last time I was with you, so you may have seen some of this, but we'll be able to go a little bit deeper today than we did the last time. So, here are the requests. Verses 1 through 5, the request is glorify the Son. That's where unity starts. Unity starts by lifting up Jesus. Um, I was born in Tucson, grew up here other than seminary, um, lived here my whole life. In 2009 was the first pastor prayer summit in Tucson. I was serving as a pastor of a church. It was pastors getting together for three and a half days to pray. If I'm honest, I didn't want to go. (laughs) I was incredibly intimidated at the thought of pastors doing nothing but praying for three and a half days. I thought that was a really bad idea, and I was not interested. But a a pastor challenged me, said, what are you going to be doing during those three days that's more important than this? Gosh darn that guy. (laughs) And I couldn't come up with a good answer, so I went. That prayer summit changed the spiritual atmosphere in our city. We went up the mountain as strangers, we came down as friends, and the outside facilitator that we brought in knew that if we started with introductions, it was going to be a rapid downhill slide from there because we'd all be talking about how big our churches were and how many people they had and what kind of buildings we had, and it would just be ugly. So never once during the entire prayer summit did he have us introduce ourselves to each other. Not once. (laughs) Of course, we did some of that on the break, and that was fine. The whole thing was focused on lifting up Jesus. Because that's where unity starts. Unity starts by lifting up Jesus. Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. That's true in every setting. It's true in citywide unity. It's true in a congregation. It's true in a small group. It's true in your family. It's true in your marriage. For those of you who are married, um, let's say hypothetically, that you get into a conflict with your spouse. Now, I'm sure that doesn't happen here because you've all been to Potter's Wheel and you know how to avoid all conflict. So I'm sure that has never happened. But hypothetically speaking, let's say that you have a conflict with your spouse. If you ask the question, either out loud or just in your own mind, what would glorify Jesus in this conflict half of the conflict is immediately gone because most of the conflict is what would glorify me. If I just ask the right question, what would glorify Jesus, it reframes the conflict and half of it is already solved. Unity in every setting starts by lifting up the sun, lifting up Jesus. The next one in verses 11 through 15 is protect us from the enemy. Twice in John 17, Jesus prays that we would be protected from the enemy. Because the enemy, Satan, the devil, whatever name you choose to give to the enemy, has a primary strategy, which he's had it for, for the, since the beginning of time. Well, not quite the beginning, because he was created. But um, his constant strategy is divide and conquer. And so he's working directly against unity in the home, in the city, in the church. He's working against unity. So Jesus is praying, protect them from the enemy. 
Now, the enemy will be feeding into your ears continuously. Doesn't that thing that that other person does bug you? Doesn't that really get under your nerves? That's really irritating, isn't it? You should probably be a little bit more irritated. Um, that thing that that other person did to you, that really hurt. Let's talk about how much that hurt. Let's dwell on the hurt so that you never get to forgiveness and reconciliation. He's constantly talking like that because his chief strategy is to divide and conquer. Jesus thought we needed to be protected from the enemy. So if he thought that, how much better and more important is it for you and I to be praying, God, protect us from the enemy. That's a good prayer to pray every time you walk in the doors on a Sunday morning at Oasis because he'll try to divide you. The third one is, uh, so glorify the son, protect us from the enemy. The third one is sanctify us in the truth because the enemy is not just out there. The enemy is in here. Um, again, uh, it doesn't have to be marriage. It can be anything. Think back to the last couple of conflicts that you've been a part of. Big or small. Last couple of conflicts that you were a part of. Got a couple? Okay, what's the common denominator? I set you up. <laughs> it's you. Because <laughs> the question was conflicts that you were involved in. So you're the common denominator. See, we bring our baggage with us wherever we go. And we are part of the issue in any conflict that we're a part of. If we were full of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, how many, how many conflicts would be solved before they ever got started? So Jesus says, sanctify them in the truth. Sanctify, set apart. It's another word for Holy Spirit. Fill them with your Holy Spirit in the truth of God's word so that we mature and grow up and don't keep doing the same things over and over again in every situation. Make sense? And then the fourth petition is make them one. We talked about that before the break. So if you haven't seen this before, here's how you can remember it always. The first three are an acronym. It's the GPS for unity. This is how G unity happens. It's the roadmap for unity. Glorify the Son, lift up Jesus, protect us from the enemy, sanctify us in the truth, and then God will make us one. It's the roadmap for unity. Jesus, in his prayer, is showing us how to answer the prayer just by praying it. It's completely changed the way that I pray for my wife and my kids. Um, I was with a pastor a couple of weeks ago who was describing a very tense situation in his congregation. And so I introduced him to the pattern of John 17 and said, I would encourage you and this other guy to pray that prayer together. I think it'll help you get through this conflict. That's one of the ways we can be an answer to Jesus' prayer is by praying it. It's actually that simple. So um, if you're interested in going a little bit deeper than what we've had time to do here this morning, uh, there are some resources on the table before you leave the, the, the room. There's a sign-up list for a newsletter that we do every Tuesday that's what we're learning about unity around the city. It also has opportunities to get engaged in some things that are happening around the city and meet some folks from other congregations. There's a couple of books. This, uh, the middle one, if it was easy, Jesus wouldn't have prayed for it. <laughs> that's what it's called. <clears throat> Um, has more information on GPS 
And um, the first one is Jesus' surprising strategy, which is John 17. The last one applies John 17 to politics, which is the last thing that I talked about when I was with you a couple of years ago. So if any of those are helpful, feel free to, to, to check them out. If you want them and didn't bring any money, I'll give them to you. I don't care about selling books. Um, but they're, they're available if that would help you go deeper. Um, last thing that we want to do before we close. Jesus is inviting us into his own experience of unity in the Trinity. The, the Bible says God is love. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in this continuous love service, submission relationship to each other in ways that I'll, I won't understand even when I'm in heaven. <clears throat> um, but he's inviting us into what he has experienced eternally. That's in the prayer a couple of times. As you are in me, may we be in them. May they be in us. It's in there several times in John 17. So I'd like to pray that for you as we close this morning. Jesus, thank you so much for um, leaving the safe place of heaven to enter the messy place of this world. Thank you for modeling what it looks like to be a person of love, a person of service, a person of humility. Thank you for, for praying this prayer so that we would have a pattern for prayer that can change our lives. And we pray again this morning as that you would draw us into yourself. We pray that Jesus would be glorified in everything we do the rest of this day. We pray that we'd be protected from the enemy even before we leave the building this morning. We pray that you would sanctify us in your truth. Help us grow. Show us our blind spots. Help us mature and make us one. In Jesus' name.